Hey, uh, welcome to Articulated Points Live. I'm Philip. I'm here with uh, my friend Patrick. And with us, we have Marv Wolfman, a uh, longtime Hi. comic book writer and screenwriter. <laughs> How are you? It's great to be here. I really appreciate you giving us some time today. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, I was just uh, hoping that we could maybe get started by you telling us a little bit about uh, about your body of work, like a, a summary of your career, maybe how you got started in comics and in screenwriting. Uh, since I've been doing it for over 55 years now, um, giving a quick summary is virtually impossible. Uh, <laughs> the... I was a fan, obviously, as I said, I think most people who get into comics uh, were at one point or another uh, from the days of the old Superman TV show, um, which I had seen without knowing what it was. It was just the next show on the, on the network uh, that was playing and um, was amazed by it. And at the end, my friend and I ran to the corner, went to the candy store and bought our first comic books. And... Uh, was hooked ever since. So uh, when I got a little older, uh, one day uh, I was sending letters to the comics for the letter columns and things like that. But one day I got uh, two little fan magazines in the mail because uh, the editor, Julie Schwartz, uh, would print the addresses of the, uh, of the kids who wrote in. So two people who were in fandom who were doing fanzines um, uh, sent me their fanzines, and uh, I became hooked on that and then started to do my own uh, with time, uh, which I wrote and I drew. I had four different fanzines, I think. Uh, there was a superhero fanzine called Super Adventures and a, a horror fanzine called Stories of Suspense and a humor fanzine called The Foob, well, about sort of a funny animal character, and a, an opinion fanzine called What the? And uh, at some point, because of the stories I wrote and drew in uh, the horror fanzine, I got a, a letter, a letter from uh, Joe Orlando, an editor at DC, asked if I wanted to submit ideas for House of Mystery, and that began it. Wow. Um, Speaking of your uh, horror fanzine. You uh, you also printed some uh, stories from other people in there too, and uh, I think you gave a, a start to a, a little known author. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, uh, what did a lot of different people. Would, of course, I wasn't writing everything, and a friend of mine uh, sent me the story that someone else wrote and gave him permission to try and place, and it was a horror. It was a horror story called. Um, uh, in a half world of terror, at least that's the name that we gave it, and it was written by some kid named Steve King. So it was Stephen King's very first uh, printed story. It had appeared elsewhere, but only part of it. This was the first full printing, from what I understand. Sort of amazing. That's, that's great. Uh, hey, first question from the audience: <laughs> Did you keep all of your fanzines from back then? Yeah, I, I think I have them all. Uh, uh, they're not easy to find, uh, but um, uh, I believe that I have most, if not all of them. Uh, some One may have gotten lost at some point. I don't know. Not the Stephen King, because I just saw that. <laughs> you have had a few moves since then. Yeah. And things tend to get buried under boxes, and you, you, know, you know how many boxes I've got. And now I have... <laughs> Add another 10 years worth of boxes since then. Yeah, I think all the ones I've helped you get rid of have uh, multiplied. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So the answer is yes, who, uh, whoever sent that. <laughs> so um, what, what was it like early on at Sunbow? I've always been curious because I hear people talk about working there. Was it... Like an office setting, like did you did you write at the offices or would you write at home and, and bring it in? Well, what happened was um, uh, I got a call one day. Uh, I was living in New York at the time. I got a call from Steve Gerber, 
who was one of the main people on uh, at Sunbow and GI Joe and a whole bunch of other uh, features. And he asked me if I was interested in writing animation. Uh, I had never written animation before, and uh, but I thought that sounded interesting. Um, and I said yes. And he said we had a he had a rough idea for something, and he wanted me to take it and and uh, expand on it, then then write the script for it. And um, now I had not seen, to be honest, uh, much of GI Joe at that particular point. Uh, I was probably just too old uh, for for that for that kind of show, and I wasn't that interested. But then, because they asked me about it, I decided to watch it. And fortunately, it was very easy to catch up on, uh, and I really liked it. Uh, it was not the same type of kiddie show that I was expecting. Uh, you know, you grow up with He-Man or with uh, some of the other ones that are meant for six to ten-year-olds, uh, and now you're 16 or 17 or 18, you go, this isn't for me. But G.I. Joe actually had real good stories and real good plots and real good characters. Uh, so I had a great time writing the episode, and the guys at uh, Sunbow really liked what I did. Uh, so they asked me if I was interested in becoming a, uh, an on-staff producer. Uh, and I'm going, oh, my God, I have no knowledge of how one does any of this stuff. Um, but uh, the problem was... They wanted they wanted me to be in New York, and I had already just made plans to move to California. So um, uh, they said, "Okay, would you like to then be a story editor? Uh, because you can do that from California, since all the other people working at, uh, at Sunbow were in California." Sunbow was a uh, an office in Westwood uh, on the second floor of this building in Westwood, which is a uh, um, community right outside of UCLA. Um, and it was really cool. I got there, uh, liked everybody instantly. Everybody was really good and discovered that the Sunbow, as you know, uh, was sort of the advertising arm for Kenner. Um, and again, you would expect being an advertising arm that what they wanted you to do was really play up every all the toys. Everything that you could buy, uh, really play up the uh, vehicles, really play up the weapons, really play up the action figures. But that wasn't what they asked for. They actually never once talked about that stuff. I don't think I ever got a list of what what toys or anything I should ever feature. They Their view was write good stories about characters that we care about. And the, and the fans, if they really like it, will go and buy the toys. But if you try to sell them toys, that's not it. Just worry about doing good stories with great character. And I'm going. This could be a lot of fun. This is I get. I got to be in animation. I did not know that Sunbow was an anomaly. They were like one of the very few companies that ever concerned itself about that. So I wrote um, GI Joe for them, and I wrote Transformers, uh, including bringing Optimus Prime back from the dead, and I wrote Jim, um, My Little Pony, and some other stuff. Uh, well, since you brought it up, there's a whole thing about bringing Optimus Prime back from the dead. I'm sure. It's kind of become like a recurring joke now because they keep killing him off and bringing him back. But you, you were the first to do it. And I, I know <laughs> there was a whole reason why you did it. <laughs> oh, well, what's, the thing about it was, um, you know, there was never a show like Transformers before. Uh, there was no, nobody ever expected that toy shows uh, that anyone cared about that, except that if they were fun action stories or fun character stories and stuff like that, but that you didn't get involved with the characters because they were toys, and the toy company just assumed that was it. So they they were making they were clearing space from the previous uh, uh, years worth of characters and now the last few years worth of characters, and they wanted to introduce a brand new line of characters. So they killed them off, thinking. Well, nobody's really going to be objecting to that. They were pretty wrong about that. Boy, they got mail. And they panicked because they didn't realize how popular their shows were. They knew it was well. The ratings were good. 
but they had no idea how much people were invested in the characters. And uh, being the last of that year's story editors, having come in from New York and such, um, I was uh, I was the last one to get an assignment of what I was going to story edit, so I was the last one there. Everyone else had already taken off for the summer. And uh, they said, I got to write... Um, an episode of a, a two-part episode of Transformers, uh, which brought back Optimus Prime from the Dead to indicate that, and also featured every Transformer that had ever been, including all the ones from the pre from the next year's toy line. And they gave me this folder. I think it was like a hundred pounds or something. Um, and uh, so I went through everything and they didn't care if they just popped up, but to try to do whatever I could to make them interesting and stuff. And uh, I had, I think it was two weeks to do it. And now normally uh, I would have two to three weeks to write a single episode. This was two episodes and having to do it in, I think, two weeks um, and learn everything about every one of those characters because nobody knew them all. Uh, and figure out a really good story and and such. Uh, working with a co-writer uh, friend, uh, I, I put out most of the story, and uh, she helped on uh, on uh, helping me with that. Um, and got in uh, on schedule that two-parter uh, with all the characters, and I was so exhausted at the end of it. I had never seen the episode. I had just, I couldn't even think about seeing the episode. It was like, this was a nightmare to do. And when, and but we started to get in mail about how much they, people liked it. And um, I guess because, uh, you know, uh, the characters were really good and people were invested in them. So if you play to the characters, if you play to what they think, how they act, and you just tell a, good, a decent story, people are going to enjoy that. And the fact that we brought Optimus back was one more step. So I finally watched the show uh, reluctantly uh, and discovered I did like it. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it was a really hard assignment to do all of that uh, under that schedule. I can imagine that would have been really difficult. I think in another interview, you mentioned that there were maybe some things that you would have added to it if you'd had more time. Was there anything that you wanted to expand upon regarding that? Was there anything that you would have done differently if you had been given more than a short period of time? I am sure that that interview was done a lot closer to when I did the story. Okay. We're talking about, what, 35 years? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, I wrote a... I wrote a few more uh, Transformers after that, and mm -hmm. I, I helped create uh, Beast Machines, uh, including the new characters in that, and came up with a storyline for that, and wrote a, uh, wrote a bunch of episodes for that. But I, I, I'm glad I remember the name of the characters, and most of the time I don't even do that. So no, I, I have, I do not remember what my plans were. But when you only have two weeks, you don't have a chance to really finesse it. And um, fortunately, uh, because I had been in comics and been writing for a long time and writing sort of this type of fantasy and uh, science fiction and such, uh, it felt it was something I felt very comfortable doing. But you always can see other things that you want to add to it. You can see things. Why didn't I do that? That would that would make the story five percent better. This would make it ten percent better. This would you know you you see them because. You're rushing to get the deadline in and you're trying to do the very best job possible, but you can't, your mind can't be in a hundred directions at once. So you do the best you can. Fortunately, as I say, most people seem to like it. So don't tell me if you don't. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I, I love the return of Optimus Prime. I, I think that episode was done so well with uh, really good key moments of Optimus using the Matrix as such an iconic moment, I think, for for Transformers fans. So I really appreciate your work on that. Well, as I, say, I really immersed myself into it the way you have to when you're doing that. You just, uh, first I did that with G.I. Joe, as I said, not having seen it, except at the, while, I, while I was working on it. You have to totally immerse yourself into the story, the world, and more importantly, the characters themselves. And uh, if you can do that, if you can really 
like just get right in there and, and absorb it all, you'll do a good story. Uh, you hope. Uh, so one thing I wanted to know about, and I don't think really ever gets out there, is like, how did Sunbow work? The, the behind the scenes stuff. How does you know the company function or create its episodes? Um, I was only there, you know, for a relatively short time in comparison to the company itself. Um, what would happen for me at least, and I don't know how it worked for Flintilly or, you know, Buzz Dixon or any of those guys, but, um, I would get uh, a call and say, we need a G.I. Joe episode. Um, and, uh, they may have one or two things about it if there was something vitally important that had to be done. And uh, sometimes they would tell tell you which character should be in it, but you have a choice of any characters you want, plus maybe this one character or something of that sort. But there was never this feeling that uh, everything was being insisted on. Uh, they, as I say, they mostly cared about having good stories. Uh, and as I also said, the not having done animation before, I didn't realize how good it was there. Uh, other companies would micromanage you to the point that you couldn't even, you couldn't if you try to write a good story. It just wouldn't happen. And, and here it was all encouraged. But uh, you'd get notes, you'd hand in a, a rough idea, maybe a page or two pages. And if if that fit everything they were interested in, if, if, if it hit the right beats, if it, hit, uh, if it was the correct thing, uh, they, you'd get a go-to um, outline, which was a beat-by-beat beat, uh, synopsis of the story. This, 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 this happens. Uh, and if that's approved, um, you, get, uh, you, you start working on the script itself. Uh, all of that was being handled in New York which is why I can't give you a lot of answers how it gets done. I just know that at some point somebody uh, would get back to me and say, this works, this works, this doesn't work. And they were pretty good. For, uh, again, you think that an advertising agency would be more concerned with just promoting how great the characters were, but their view was just tell a good story. And if the fans like it, they'll buy the toys, but you can't make them. You just have to make them interested in the characters. And that was such a welcome relief as to what came later. Because I did a, a G.I. Joe, a couple of G.I. Joes, I think, for Deke. And it was a totally different experience. And the guys there were good, but uh, they weren't Sunbow good. Because I've done other work for Deke. So. Um, maybe we should take a couple of questions from the uh, comments here. Uh, I'm going to pick this one. It says, with all your experience on G.I. Joe and Transformers animation, were you ever offered to write for the G.I. Joe or Transformers comics? No, you would think they would have said something, but no. Wow. And since, basic, since my basic uh, profession is comic book writing, I would have thought so, but no. Now, on G.I. Joe, I would understand that because Larry Hammer created so much of that stuff, and he was writing it, but Transformers didn't have a single writer on it, so that would have been fun. Oh, this is another one. Another good one from Adam. Uh, Zoe would like to know what it feels like to go through life having the coolest name ever. Um, I don't know anything else. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I was born. You know, it's real. It wasn't changed. I don't know. I can't compare it to anything. I mean... Uh the fact that you are named Wolfman did actually cause a little bit of an issue back in the 70s for one comic book you were writing for, right? Yeah. Uh, God, I've uh, told that story 15 million times now. Um, <laughs> yeah, the Comics Code uh, didn't um, didn't allow werewolves and vampires and a whole bunch of things and Wolfmans uh, back in the 1960s. And my... Um, the person uh, at a DC, they had a, a host character introducing each one of their different uh, monster books. So in House of 
House of Secrets, I think it was, um, the character of Abel was the guy who hosted it. And the writer who wrote the page of, of Abel hosting it knew I wrote the, uh, wrote the story that was to follow and said the following story is, was told to me by a wandering wolfman as a joke because he knew it was me and my name fit, uh, fit that. But the comics coach said, you can't do that. And they said, that's his real name. Uh, and they said, okay, but you have to then put a credit there's a there has to be a credit that says it so people will know that's not the monster it's a person's name now you can't see it but over there is the page the first page of the story with my name in it because it had to be added a, a later so i have that on my wall right now uh my first credit and as soon as i got a credit of course all the other writers wanted one that's you amazing. kind of revolutionized the comic book that way, <laughs> unintentionally. Unintentionally. Uh, Philip also tells me that you have an interesting story regarding the creation of the names of, uh, is it Black Cat and Spider Woman? Of who? I'm sorry. Of Black Cat and Spider Woman. Oh, uh, not Spider Woman, though I were, uh, though I did write it. Uh, uh, Black Hat uh, uh, was my creation, um, and of course the name uh, the uh, the name of the character was. A, I originally uh, created her to be a character in Spider Woman, which I was writing. Uh, Archie Goodwin created uh, created it, and then I took over with the first issue. He created it for Marvel Premiere, I think it was, or Spotlight, or against fuzzy after a while um and uh they asked me to take it over for the for her getting a regular book they didn't think that spider woman was going to be that popular because for them they were just they they just wanted to protect the name spider woman because some animation company was trying to do like a spider-man thing but with a woman so they wanted to get their name in first to make sure it was safe uh so i was writing that and I came up with the character of Black Hat to be her villain, but then I decided to leave Spider Woman because I, I didn't really have any uh, major good ideas uh, for her, and I moved over to Spider Man, and uh, took Black Hat with me, uh, and that became wow. the Black Hat that we all know. Wow. Yeah, but you have a little story yes. behind their uh, uh, civilian identities. <laughs> you look at. The first Spider-Man with Spider-Woman in it, all of it's very clearly written in the letter column. I explain the whole story and publish the original cover when she was supposed to be part of Spider-Woman. So you can see that all in the letter column of that issue of Spider-Man. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, what, what was it, Philip? We had a little story about uh, her identity, the, the name Felicia Hardy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, um, I'm trying to recall. Uh, Spider Woman's name is uh, Jessica Drew. Um, Jessica is my daughter's name, and she was named after my daughter. And Drew came from Nancy Drew. Uh, so when I came up with uh, Black Cat, um, I, I was sort of thinking about the fact that I had Nancy Drew in there, so I had to have the Hardy Boys. Uh, so she became, you know, uh, Felicia Hardy, Felicia for Cat, and also Felix the Cat and all of that sort of stuff, and uh, the Hardy Boys. So you had Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. Wow. Making their way into Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Uh, speaking of references, uh, Diana actually has a question. She said uh, that you, she's heard you speak about character development and making them believable, like Quick Kick being a classic movie slash media buff who quotes lines. Do things like that come from people you know? Uh, no, I was just trying to come up with a nice, um, uh, easy to understand uh, quirk for the characters. Also, uh, Though nobody does it in the way that uh, Quick Kick did in that particular story, um, 
we're always referring to uh, to movie uh, dialogue. You know, uh, who doesn't? Half the time you hear a funny line that comes from a movie or something of that. So it is a touchstone to something that I think a lot of people do just in general, and therefore something that a, someone watching the show would get a kick out of. A quick kick in this case. <laughs> Yeah, that, that also happened with Rekgar. I, I actually think that there's a line from Rekgar in The Return of Optimus Prime where he gives one of his funniest lines ever that I still pe see people quote where he says, I'm a pepper, wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? In relation to the spreading of, of the of the plague. And that one, I was laughing so hard as a kid. I probably missed like the next 10 seconds or so of the show. And I, I still see people mention, mention that online with Rekgar. There's a new toy and people are posting it saying, uh, this is my pepper. So it it's was a really great moment. Cool. Um, I'm surprised people even get that reference anymore. Dr. Pepper does not make that slogan. Yeah, I, want to know what, I want to know what he's a doctor of, you know. Right. <laughs> Why it's not just Mr. Pepper. Yeah. It's weird, yeah. that's older than Coke. I don't get that, but whatever. <laughs> Okay. Um, did you require a lot of research to understand the completely different ro rotating casts between characters between Sunbow and the Deke G.I. Joe series? I would imagine in between writing scripts, there probably were a lot of characters added or removed. Did, did that require a lot of research? Uh, they would usually give you the material. Uh, okay. Uh, the same way I learned them, they have folders filled with this sort of material and what the character is about and such like that. The biggest thing is trying to figure out why the character acts the way they do. And in some cases, it was easy because nobody had done anything with it. Uh, for instance, that thing with Quick Kick. So that became a, a handle for him for other writers. Uh, but nobody had really played off the characters in the same way so when I was free to do something that was a that was I thought would be a, of interest to the fans. Okay. Um, did you get to review the storyboards somewhere in the process after your script had been approved? Like, how much involvement did you have after like a Sunbow script would be approved? Uh, because I think most of that stuff was done on the East Coast. Uh, the producers and everybody were on the East Coast. We were sort of like a creative, the creatives, uh, uh, the writers primarily. Uh, I didn't have much at all. I don't think I ever saw the storyboards. I could be mistaken. You know, it's a long time, but I don't seem to. I don't really recall it. Um, how different is writing a script versus for a cartoon versus writing a script for a comic? Well. The fact that you're dealing with actors now uh, and means that they can put a, um, they could say a line in a certain way that you don't need as many words. They can give you the feel of what they're trying to say with just, uh, you know, a, a sound. Um, but one of the things that uh, you have with, uh, a comic uh, is the amount of copy you can actually put on a page uh, or in a panel uh, and not cover up all the artwork. But in animation, you have a similar difference where you have to think how much time is there for the character to say this speech. So if, for instance, in animation, you have a character walking across a room, uh, you actually have to think it's going to take nine seconds in real life to walk across that room. That means he, you have to figure out how to keep the dialogue to that space. So there's a lot of differences in comics. You can do panel after panel after panel of, of that stuff, but in animation, it's constantly moving. So you have to be very aware of that. Okay. Um, let's see. I think this is a sentiment we all have. You have no idea how much you added to my childhood. I truly thank you, even though I watch these still daily. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thanks very much. I enjoyed doing it. I really liked uh, writing the stuff. Um, I wish I had gotten to do more on the uh, Beast Machines uh, since I did uh, most of the creation of the er on the early creation of that uh, that show. It would have been nice to. I did a bunch of episodes, but I would love to have done more. Speaking of doing more on things, was there? I mean, GI Joe kind of ended with GI Joe the movie. Was there anything that? that you recall with that or Transformers beyond the return of Optimus Prime that you may have been all like, was there more that you may have worked on or was there, there any, any, any kind of continuation of that that you recall at all? It's if been there, a long time. If there was, they probably went to Flint or one okay. of the writers who was also producers. I, I was still a, a fledged, even though I had been writing for years and that's why they were able to hire me and I could do it. Um, uh, those guys were specialists in, in animation and I was still a, new, a newbie so they would have gone to them I, I would have um, Can you go into a little more detail in the creation of Beast Machines how you were involved in that? Uh, there was sort of a um, an open call in many ways uh, where a whole bunch of writers were encouraged to come up to the office and talk about what they would do if they had if they were doing beast machines and the the people from Kenner were there and the people from the network were there and everybody uh was going to give a short concept of what they think uh it should be and they really liked my uh my uh suggestion um Strange enough, they also like the fact when they'd ask me a question, I'm pretty honest, and it's like, why, why didn't you talk about, why didn't you do this or something like that? And I would say, you know, we had two weeks to prepare for this. I did everything I could to make it work, and I just couldn't get every, I couldn't get it all in. And they said they had never heard a writer be honest like that, uh, and they liked that. Uh, they liked the fact that. I wasn't going to play games with them here. I'm looking for a job, but at the same point, uh, I'm still go I'm going to be honest, and I think that's really important. Uh, I couldn't figure out everything I wanted to do with the show. There was no way. I didn't have enough time to do that. Uh, but I put together the things that they liked. Unfortunately, they already there was a deal with Fox and uh, the the guys who did. Um, Godzilla, uh, which was the number one show at the time, um, moved over to um, uh, Beast Machines to take over from where I was. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, I certainly appreciated a lot of the uh, concepts and stuff that you presented. That that was a, a great period of Transformers for me, as many of them were. Um. um Yes. Did you have a question, Philip? Oh, you're just trying to look up something. Um, I know we've got a lot of characters you've created over the years, and uh, nowadays, you know, superhero movies are everywhere, superhero TV shows are everywhere. Uh, I think, was the first character you created or helped create that ever actually made it to a movie, was that actually Blade? Uh First major character at Marvel that I created would be Blade. Um, I mean, who, who made it into a movie? Oh, yeah. Uh, Blade was first, I think. Um, uh, the second, uh, actually, he's the second character I created, but the first that went, went anywhere. The second one, I believe, is, is going because I created uh, Destiny for the, who has been in um, the Sandman. Uh, I created Destiny for uh, a book called Weird Mystery Tales. He was the host of that particular book. And at some point, Neil Gaiman, uh, years later, uh, called me and said that he wanted, would it be okay with me if he used Destiny as one of the endless. And Neil's like one of the best writers out there. And I knew he'd do a great job. And I said, sure. Yeah. And so Destiny was in the end, as it was in the endless. 
how is it seeing all these characters you've helped create come alive on the big screen and reach even wider audiences like Cyborg or Starfire, Raven, your the Teen Titans TV show on HBO Max, or now we're getting uh, Vigilante on uh, the Peacemaker TV show. Yeah, and they're talking about Nova uh, at Marvel. Uh, they, they haven't said when, but it seems to be uh, something sooner than later. Um, and uh, yeah, the whole Nova Corps showed up in Guardians of the Galaxy. They're they're going to be in a ride and. Orlando's Epcot. It's, you're going to uh, the whole roller coaster ride for Guardians of the Galaxy. There is actually going to be you going to like a pavilion, like they have the World Pavilion, where it shows off like a World's Fair part of Epcot. Uh, the ride's conceit is that you're going to the pavilion for that planet, <laughs> and so you're going to be seeing all that when things go wrong and you have to go on an uh, adventure. Uh, they're going to be using the uh, Nova Core. Yeah, like Mary Close is re reprising her character in that movie to introduce you to the ride. Well, yeah, uh, interesting. Um, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't work at Marvel these days, uh, uh, though I am writing a um, introduction for them right now uh, for one of the reprint books that they're doing. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't do any comics for them. Uh, so I don't know any of those. I never know any of that stuff until it happens. But they've done such a great job with the movies that uh, I I can't imagine being anything but uh, thrilled when I do get to see it. Well, I think it opens next year. So uh, even if you don't get it out to Epcot, there's going to be plenty of videos online of people take, recording off of the, their experiences. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I can't imagine getting to um, to Epcot in the next year or so uh, until we're absolutely safe, uh, COVID-wise. Okay, here we have another one that was asked. Uh, what was the actual? What was the average turnaround time from concept to having an actual episode ready to go? So, if you're working on Sunbow and you wrote an episode, how long would it be before it actually aired? I guess would probably be start oh. to finish do you do you recall that or maybe did you not notice them airing when they did no the, th the thing about it is that uh i was on the front end of the things i was writing the scripts you know, or if i was story editing a book uh at that point i'd be going over the script and fixing or sending it back or whatever else so th the script could uh, be just a couple of weeks uh, from initial assignment to finishing it uh, how long it takes to actually animate the episode. That could be six months, seven months, a year. It depends on wh how they work it out. I have no idea. I think it's very fluid. Uh, but uh, the script part of it, just a couple of weeks. Okay. For comparison, what's the average turnaround time for a comic book? A couple of days. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not for the art, for the script. The art could take, depending upon who the artist is, um, it could take a couple of days, uh, you know, a week or two to uh, someone like Jack Kirby who would do three comics or four comics in a month. Uh, I don't think anybody can do that anymore. I don't know how he did that back then. <laughs> uh, Jack, Jack was a miracle. Uh, he could do more work that was brilliantly done than anybody else. I think stuff like the Eternals come to screen or even like the look of Thor Ragnarok, it's nice to know that people still remember him. Yeah, um, the characters look cool. so much like they just came out of Jack's pencil, so it's hard to believe. Thor looks exactly like Jack's drawing. Okay. Did you have any else? Anything else, Philip? Uh, I'm sure. You want to give me a moment? I gotta look through my notes. <laughs> um, so obviously, you've got a, a really long career. Uh, we've got highlights like the New Teen Titans or Crisis on Infinite Earths. 
and even that got adapted into uh, a TV show version about two years ago. Uh, and you had a little cameo in that. Yes, it was fun. They brought me up to Vancouver and um, I got to act. Uh, I didn't write the dialogue, of course. Uh, I was, re I was uh, reading a script um, and um, I, the guys did a really good job with it. It was sort of amazing because it's such a complex story feat in the comics featuring hundreds by hundreds of characters and they managed to keep the spirit of the of the original alive uh which was amazing to me and i was so, surprised how closely they made the monitor's costume from the comics <laughs> yeah yeah he was he was pretty special uh uh really tall you know i'm close to six two and he hovered over me Uh, now, you've also done writing for video games as well. Um, do you want to speak to what that experience is like a bit? Um, fortunately, I've been a player. It's something I always enjoyed. I've been playing games since they first came out. And so I understood the language of video games, um, which is really important. I think a lot of writers, you know, write as if uh, they're doing a linear story. And video games is is not con video games are not constructed in the same way, um, say a pro story is. Uh, yet you still have to hit fairly similar beats. Uh, you have to have good characters. You have to have good action. You have to have all those things good, but they move in a very different way than prose does or a comic does. So I enjoy it. I'm working on a game right now. So. Um, and something that I've been uh, doing and I hope uh, will continue to. What are some other some other things that you're working on right now, just so that people can uh, keep a lookout for some of your other upcoming work? Unfortunately, almost everything I do has a non-disclosure agreement. Oh, right, right. So, well, how about stuff you've done recently that's already come out? <laughs> um, go ahead. Uh, some... I'm trying to recall if the video game, uh, if one of the video games that uh, obviously comics, uh, there's a whole bunch of comics out there that people probably don't even realize I'm on. Um, I did a Wonder Woman and Aquaman, uh, um, uh, some other stuff that I can't even recall at this point. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, here's a question. Uh, what what do you prefer writing for, comics or cartoons? Or I guess we could throw video games in there as well. Um, what's your preference? My basic preference is comics. Uh, I think partially because they make the less the least money. You're bothered the least. You have more freedom. <laughs> you have more freedom to do what you really want. Uh, you can't do that with video games. I mean, as much as I really love writing video games, there's hundreds of people involved. There are all the engineers, there are all the designers, there's so many different people. I've had so many situations where you write what they want, but then they discover they can't do the tech. So you have to rewrite the whole thing to fit the tech that they can do. So comics uh, is the most. Um, uh, what I'm trying to think of what I'm trying to say is the one that's open to you doing what you want the most. Uh, it's usually you, the editor, and the artist. And once the once you work out the material with the editor, it's just you and the artist. And almost uh, never does the editor get it back into it until the very end, uh, where they go over the material, and make sure it all works. But it's the fewest people are involved, so you get the chance to do what you really want. Anything else? Um, yeah, so uh, back in the 90s, I know you were involved with uh, Disney Adventures and how uh, you kind of had to squeeze in comics credits in that. I... I I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not understanding. 
Uh, back in the 90s, you were involved with the Disney Adventures magazine and yeah. how you, uh, you had to squeeze in the credits for those comics that you helped create. I don't remember any problem. You, I may have said them to you, but I don't remember any problems right now. Because the credits were always, Disney was fairly good about uh, us putting the credits uh, on the, on the, in type. So they weren't in the comic itself, but they were in type. Uh, but they did that for, because Disney, uh, Disney Adventures was about half uh, half comics and half uh, prose articles. And they did the same for the writers of the uh, articles. So if there's something I'm, I'm forgetting, yeah, I forgot. You had to keep the credit on the inside towards the spine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the way they did it with all uh, with everybody. So it wasn't something, it may have been hard to see it and you, easy to miss, but they weren't picking out comics. They, that's the way they handled the credits in that magazine. And everyone, everyone got a credit. So, you know, which is, which is more important than where it was. Anything else we got here? We're probably um, about done, I think. Well, there's a, what's a, uh, see, there's a uh, question in the audience there, I think. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, you've had many legendary artistic collaborators over the years. Is there a particular artist that you feel best brought your words to life on the page as you envisioned them in your mind? And that is from Adam Riches, who himself is a comic artist. Um, I think I, you know, I've worked with some brilliant artists, but the one, uh, the one who probably uh, worked with the best in so many different ways was uh, George Perez, uh, who was not only maybe one of the best artists ever in comics, but also one of the best people I've ever known. And he's not doing well right now. So everyone sends him good thoughts. Um, he has stage three cancer and it's not good. So uh, send them good thoughts. It's a brilliant artist, but he's even a, a much better man. Yeah, there's there's a lot of G.I. Joe fans who, who know him very well. He's very closely tied, especially with a lot of the cosplayers and people who show up to conventions. You know, he's yeah, George, been there often. People know him well and, and really appreciate everything he's done. George, uh, George loves people in, in uh, cosplay uh, because it, it really gets, it shows how the people are drawn into what we all do and how much they love it and try to be part of it. And he loves that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, I just also want to say that I really appreciate everything that you have done as a, as a kid. I would try because obviously when I was younger, we didn't have the internet movie database. So I would try to pay attention to credits of things. And I could just remember being very young and just seeing your name several times in multiple places and just being absolutely amazed and appreciative at how much you've put out there that felt like it was specifically for me is the way that it felt, but it, it was for all of us. So I really appreciate it. I, I appreciate it. Uh, I really love what I do. It's, it's hard to, uh, feel, you know, it, that there are problems when you absolutely always wanted to do this and you get a chance to do it and seems to go over and people seem to like it. So uh, you can't ask for anything more than that. And I, I thank you. Well, thank you thank for you coming on with us. Uh, I know I've been talking to you about doing this for a while now, so <laughs> I'm glad I can finally uh, stop badgering you about it. <laughs> well, you take care and... We will, we will see you at some point, I'm sure, uh, as soon as uh, we dare risk going out of the house. All right. Uh, thank thank you. you for being here. Uh, thank you to our audience and for the questions you've submitted. And uh, we'll say uh, goodbye. <laughs> you take care, then. Thank you. Thank you.